Hello Internet, and welcome to another episode of Supreme Court Saturday. As always, I'm your host, Stephen Mackey. Today we're talking about habeas corpus, the two words in a language spoken only by saints and lawyers that keep the government from detaining you indefinitely. Now, clearly you don't want your government to be able to lock people up and throw away the key, but some would argue that in certain situations you might want that to happen. So, let's look at some of the cases and see what the Constitution says you can detain someone for without trial. First, we have 1859's Abelman vs. Booth. Now this case is aged about as well as a bottle of 1995 warm milk. So an abolitionist Steve Booth rallied up a mob to help free an escaped slave, making it one of the only times in US history when a black person might have thought to themselves, oh man, I'm so glad this mob of white people is here. As you can imagine, this did not go over too well because this was a pre-Civil War America and Booth was violating the Fugitive Slave Act by not returning the slave to its owner. Anyways, Booth was arrested by Marshall Abelman and appealed his arrest to the Wisconsin court, who ruled that he should be released. But Marshall Abelman wasn't so sure that they knew the law, so he kept Booth imprisoned and appealed to the state Supreme Court, which in a landmark decision we'll just gloss right over, ruled the Fugitive State Act unconstitutional. But then it went to the Supreme Court with Booth still sitting in his cell. The Supreme Court said that the state Supreme Courts did not have the ability to rule laws unconstitutional and therefore had no right to pardon Booth or the rule against the Fugitive Slave Act. So at this last second, the Supreme Court swooped in and kept Booth locked up. Meanwhile, in an ironic twist, the slave Booth had freed was living free in Canada. Now this brings us to 1861's Ex Part Merriman. This case happened right as the Civil War was starting, so you bet there were a few people that the US government wouldn't mind temporarily storing. Generally, habeas corpus can be suspended by an act of Congress, but since some things don't change at this point with the Civil War starting, Congress wasn't in session. Half of the country just broke off, but hey, have fun with your families. The question was, in the absence of Congress, can the executive branch suspend habeas corpus? And it was quickly ruled by the Supreme Court, because apparently they don't get Congress's vacation package, that the president can neither suspend habeas corpus himself, nor command military officers to suspend habeas corpus. Which brings us to 1869's Ex Part McArdle. Now this case revolved around William McArdle, a journalist whose articles Breitbart would call a little too hateful for publication. It was the Reconstruction Era South though, so you could write anything. Oh wait, never mind, because under the Military Reconstruction Act of 1867, these writings were ruled illegal and he was arrested and sent to jail. When he appealed to the local circuit court, citing habeas corpus, they found the actions of the military leader just under the laws laid out in the act. Man, what did he have to write to have the southern Mississippi judges agree with the Union that you were a little too confederate? Here's where the thing starts to get sketchy though, because under the Habeas Corpus Act of 1867, if you appeal to a court citing habeas corpus and they deny it, you can appeal that act to the Supreme Court, and that's exactly what he did. After all the arguments were said in the Supreme Court, but before a verdict could be announced, Congress stripped the Supreme Court of the right to rule on this case, citing Article 3, Section 2 of the Constitution, leading the Supreme Court to have to answer a new question. What? And more importantly, can Congress do this? Well, in a decision that must have taken all of the self-discipline, the Supreme Court ruled that Congress could strip them of viewing habeas corpus appeals, and that has since been the rule of the land. This case will come up again when we talk about Guantanamo Bay later in this episode. Next to 1869's Ex Part Yerger. In this case, Yerger stabbed to death the mayor of Jacksonville, Mississippi and was arrested and sent to jail, where he appealed claiming habeas corpus to a circuit judge which worked out about as well as you would imagine for a man who stabbed someone to death. His appeal went to the Supreme Court, which raised the question, what is Congress going to do about it this time, having just removed their ability to judge the last habeas corpus case that went their way? Well, it appeared for a second that Congress is going to remove the ability to appeal to the Supreme Court for all habeas corpus cases, but that didn't happen. When Yerger's case went to the Supreme Court, 
They agreed to give him a public trial, although he made bail and fled to Baltimore, a city where even back then you could get away with murder, and was never tried. Next to 1944's Korematsu vs United States. 1944, a Japanese last name, an episode on involuntary government detention. I think we all know where this one's going. Now this case didn't officially cite habeas corpus, but detaining an entire race into internment camps is kind of a textbook definition of what habeas corpus violations are. So what is the background on this case? Well, after Pearl Harbor, the Americans were fearing attacks from the Japanese on their western shores, so they issued Executive Order 9066, which authorized the War Department to create military areas from which any or all Americans might be excluded and provide the necessary transport, lodging, and feeding of persons displaced from such areas. Sounds pretty reasonable. About a month later, the military got involved and added Proclamation 1 that said any Japanese, German, or Italian aliens, and any person of Japanese descent, must inform the United States Postal Service of any changes of residence. Alright, maybe a little racist, but probably nothing worth writing the Supreme Court over. Then on March 24, 1942, Western Defense Command began issuing civilian exclusion orders commanding that all persons of Japanese ancestry, including aliens and non-aliens, report to designated assembly points. And from there, on March 19, 1942, that snowballed into the internment camps we think of today. Boy, that escalated quickly. Korematsu knowingly violated the civilian exclusion orders and stayed at home where he was arrested and appealed his arrest citing the 14th Amendment, which passed in the Reconstruction Era and stated that all people be treated equally under the law. The Supreme Court's response? This law wasn't inspired by racial prejudice. It's just that, right now, all Japanese people are untrustworthy, and so it's acceptable. Here's a little fun fact for you guys. This 1944 case has never been reversed, with the best denial being in 2011 when the Attorney General filed an official notice saying that, at the time, the internment camp policy was an error. What this means is that if we ever wanted to do the same in a time of war, it is still constitutionally viable as an option to intern a race of people. Wow, sorry, that was not a fun fact at all. But this brings us to 1950's Johnson vs. Eintrager. This was this case of America versus the Nazis. In 1945, Germany surrendered to the Allies, although Japan was still fighting, so Germans and China kept up the fight. Those Germans who kept fighting despite the German surrender were tried in China and found to be violating the terms of the German surrender. They were flown back to US occupied fatherland to be put in custody of the US Army. But, after being exposed to freedom in the Constitution, the captured Nazis sued the US government for violating their Fifth Amendment rights and claimed habeas corpus. Man, do people who hate America learn to love our Constitution pretty quickly. Their main argument was that China wasn't occupied by the US, so if anyone should be trying them, it should be China. Although, oh man, if you thought a trial by the US was bad, have fun trying to defend Nazism to Mao Zedong. In the end, a super controversial decision was made that will also come back when we talk about Guantanamo Bay. The Supreme Court said that they could only issue habeas corpus releases to people currently in the US, and could not issue such releases to American prisons abroad. Next to 1963's Joan vs. Cunningham, in which the Supreme Court ruled for the first time that someone could file habeas corpus not only based on the legality of their conviction, but also based on the conditions of their conviction. While this case was pretty unremarkable besides that one achievement, it did lead directly to 1964's Cooper vs. Pate, in which a black Muslim in prison claimed habeas corpus because he wasn't receiving equal rights. Although this was a pre-desegregation era, so to hear a black Muslim wasn't getting equal rights wasn't exactly breaking news. Local and federal courts dismissed the allegations because he was black and Muslim. If he had been here illegally, that would have been racist bingo. That said, the Supreme Court heard his case because he alleged habeas corpus and found in his favor, saying that prison authorities must do whatever it is within their ability to treat individuals of every religious group equally, unless they can demonstrate a good reason to do otherwise, a rule that has stayed with us to today. 
Next, we're jumping forward to 2004's Homni vs. Rumsfeld. Three cases were resolved on this day, but we're gonna start with this one. In this case, Hamdi, a US citizen, was being held indefinitely as an enemy combatant in a Virginia naval brig. After being brought up in Afghanistan in 2001, he had not been tried or brought up on any charges, so naturally he sued for habeas corpus. The Supreme Court heard him out and made the announcement that any US citizens who were arrested as enemy combatants would have the right to plead their case to an impartial tribunal. But if you're not a US citizen, sorry, you're only getting out if ISIS really does topple America. Hamdi did show up to that civilian tribunal and was deemed not to be an enemy combatant and was sent to Saudi Arabia, had his citizenship revoked, and banned from ever returning to this country. Yes, let's banish this angry and suspected enemy combatant to Saudi Arabia. They'll definitely not have any connections to any terrorist groups out there. On the same day, we saw 2004's Rumsfeld vs. Padilla, which saw Padilla, a US citizen, get detained after arriving at O'Hare Airport from Pakistan. He was arrested without charges as an unlawful combatant and was later reclassified by Bush as an enemy combatant. Not because he was suddenly found to be a bigger threat, but because this allowed us to imprison him with limited legal rights. People filed petitions to have him released, but the Secretary of State Donald Rumsfeld said that he would be held until the armed conflict with Al Qaeda ended. Which shouldn't be any day now. What the question was thought to be was whether the authorization for use of military force gave the president the power to point at anyone and yell enemy combatants and have them detained indefinitely. Or whether this violated the Non-Detention Act that says, no citizen shall be imprisoned or otherwise detained by the United States except pursuant to an act of Congress. I say we thought that was going to be the question they were going to answer because, and brace yourself for a wave of stupidity and anger, it was found that, yeah, you filed your habeas corpus petition with the Secretary of State's name in the petition instead of the commander of the brig you're being held in. So, your entire argument's invalid. Okay, thanks. Unfortunately for him, he's still in prison. Not till the last case decided that day. 2004's Rizul vs. Bush. Citing the Nazi case we discussed earlier, the US had been arresting foreigners in Afghanistan, bringing them to Cuba, locking them up, and throwing away the key. And we would have gotten away with it too if it weren't for those meddling allies. You see, in our gotta catch em all terrorist fervor, we had picked up a few Brits and Australians, and their governments were not too keen on us keeping them locked up. It was also decided in an earlier case that the US would hear arguments from US citizens held at Guantanamo Bay, which made it really hard to go back and say to the courts, you have no power to hear cases from that prison. In the end, that was reversed and the Brits and Australians were let free after pleading habeas corpus. Next to 2008's Bormadeen vs. Bush. After it was decided that foreigners detained in Cuba could plead habeas corpus, the government had to do something or else all of those people were going to get a fair trial. So they enacted the Military Commissions Act of 2006, which explicitly stated that people classified as enemy combatants or were awaiting hearings on their status could not file for habeas corpus, which held for surprisingly two years until it was brought into question by a Bosnian who was held in G-Bay. The court found that suspension of habeas corpus in this way was unconstitutional and furthermore ruled that the US had control over the territory of Guantanamo Bay and therefore de facto sovereignty, which I'm sure the Cubans just love to hear. On the same day, the Supreme Court decided on 2008's Munaf vs. Guerin. Now this is the final case of the night and this is a little bit of a head scratcher because it involved American citizens being held in Iraq by multinational forces in Iraq. And unlike most of these cases, it's a little bit trickier to pick a side. The arguments for allowing these people to have habeas corpuses, first, the sadly true argument that these are multinational forces in Iraq in 2008 essentially meaning Americans. The entire chain of command is US Army officers and the other nations were represented about as much as they are in Trump's foreign policies. 
The other argument is that if you turn these men over to the coalition members who have tried them for crimes, they might be tortured by countries with less lenient constitutions. On the other side, they are being held by a 26 nation fighting force and to just ignore the other nations because the US is in charge would violate the whole idea of a coalition. It also warns against the prospect for American judicial interference with the sovereign prerogative of foreign nations, but then again, why were we in Iraq in the first place? Lastly, there's the implication that keeping a citizen held by this fighting force actually violates their rights to a fair trial. So what happened? Well, in the US, there was another cop out, with the US saying that detained citizens could plea habeas corpus if they were being held by American forces in the American chain of command, even if it was part of a coalition. But habeas corpus did not require the US to shelter such fugitives from the criminal justice system of the sovereign, with authority to prosecute them, resulting in them getting turned over to the Central Criminal Court of Iraq. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello, YouTube. I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Supreme Court Saturday, click here. Please like and subscribe, and if you're really a fan, you can join our Facebook group. It's just a party over there.